listen, 100 to 125 fold times higher uh, than that recommendation uh, for those uh, levels, those recommended levels. So um, it isn't a little bit. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for joining me on this discussion about WAG. It's always fun to talk to you. <laughs> it's good to talk to you too. She is the owner of Xander Perioperative, and she helps nurses pass the national certification for a CNOR. And um, so yes. thank you so much for partnering with me and just having a discussion about WAG. So yeah, today we're just going to kind of share with um, nurses our experience with WAG and our health and maybe even our knowledge deficit for me was definitely a knowledge deficit starting in the PACU and then what I've learned since then. So thank you for partnering with me on this collaboration just to share the awareness of WAG with our nurses. It's a big thing that doesn't get talked about enough. I'm glad that there's some dialogue that's starting up um, because it's been in fits and starts you know, for quite some time. Um, I was telling you at a different conversation that um, I was looking at this probably around 2012, 2013, mm -hmm. um, but we didn't have the um, infrastructure uh, for a scavenging system in the recovery area where I was working at the time because there were not two sections at the head of every bedside. Some of them had, some of them didn't. Um, and they were just not willing to do that. So it's been there. I mean, it's this information's been there for a good while. It's just needs more focus, more focus. So I'm glad that you're doing this and bringing the awareness to you. Yeah, I fully agree with you, Wendy. It needs, I mean, this needs to be talked about in every single PACU and every hospital, whether it's a small community or a surgery center or it's a large teaching hospital. I mean, the fact that, and I'll go right there, is that we don't have two suction setups at the head of the bed. And so they don't implement a scavenging system because it's really as simple as just getting a second suction setup and then having a scavenging mask. Uh, it's quite affordable to implement. I remember um, when I asked about it and, um, the response I got was, well, we would have to shut the OR down to retrofit the PACU. And they were like, oh, we don't want to do that because then we won't, do that. Have, we won't have the revenue. And I said, you know, and I'm thinking in my head, well, how, how difficult would it really be to plumb in suction to every single bay? What if you just closed down your PACU on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and had your team come in and just go gangbusters and retrofit every bay so that you can protect your staff. Um, or if you can't do every bay in three days, do a quarter of them mm -hmm. and come back and do a, a quarter another weekend and another weekend if you don't want to shut them down. And maybe you can't do them all at the same time. Um, I don't know how that would work. And I'm always just shocked and appalled at how much um, anything like that costs. Uh, but what price do you put on your health and well-being? And, uh, you know, is it okay? That's that's why there needs to be regulation around this, because honestly, mm -hmm. industries, not just healthcare, but industries historically are not going to protect uh, the people who are doing the work um, unless there is a regulatory reason for them to do that and there are fines attached to it if they don't do that. Uh, because honestly, the hospital's a business, just like any other business, mm -hmm. uh, and anything that inter that they don't have to, absolutely have to do, mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to do it. <laughs> they're just not. Um, yeah. Like the testing that's required, and um, I don't know, do you want to get into the... Um, recommendations or the um, studies, the information, that's the word. Yeah, the information. let's go ahead and um, and jump into the information. And But I do want to challenge OSHA. I challenge OSHA to come out with standards for WAG in the PACU for 2023 for hospitals and for institutions because the literature is heavy in the evidence. 
and um, recent studies done by um, NIOSH uh, that got published uh, in 21-22 definitely show well above the RELs, the recommended exposure limits for the nurses in PACIO. And um, you've had health problems. I've had health problems, uh, inflammatory disease like in endometriosis that, um, you know, when my surgeon told me that I had the worst case she had ever seen, I started thinking, well, why in the world is that? And maybe it's because I was exposed to a hazard in my workplace and it was causing an inflammatory process in my body. Maybe. And see, maybe. That's the thing. there's no way that you can prove that. Right. There's no um, way I can prove it, but I, we can spread awareness. <laughs> you can, but that's the point. I mean, the fact that you have an inkling that maybe this is a problem and that I had some reproductive issues as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I have an inkling that maybe that was the problem, uh, but nobody's reporting it. I'm not, re I didn't report that to anybody. I don't, I mean, I may have casually mentioned to my physician uh, my job, but, um, and all that that, I mean, and he doesn't know that, and there's nowhere for him to report that that I'm aware of, or that why would he do that? It's not in my notes anywhere. Oh, this person's ex you know exposed to waste anesthesia gases regularly. Um, so the fact that um, there's no data being collected mm -hmm. um, routinely, um, so we really don't know um, how big this problem is because we don't have. Uh, and if, I mean, there's been a couple of studies done and everybody goes, oh, you know, this is clearly not good for you at all. Uh, but uh, if you read any of the literature, it says things like, you know, uh, complications are rare. Uh, this is uncommonly seen, those kind, that kind of verbiage. Uh, but anecdotally, being at the bedside, talking to the nurses that are there, mm -hmm. my own experience no, it's not rare. I know no, it's not. Yeah, uh, I, it's not. <laughs> I can count at least five nurses that I know of in my old PACU that all had a hysterectomy for one reason or another. Um, mm -hmm. And you got to wonder why, why is that? Um, and I remember thinking, uh, I'll never have a hysterectomy. And then, <laughs> and then I had no choice when I had stage four endometriosis. Um so yeah, yeah, let's let's share and with the nurse. and the problems that are with the um, male nurses spouses also have these problems. And if my physician doesn't know my work history, he certainly wouldn't know my spouse's work history. Mm -hmm. You see, not reported, yeah, yeah. but anecdotally we know it's there, and it's a way bigger problem than people are aware of because we don't know. I'm sorry, I interrupted. I get excited. No, you're fine. I mean, this is something that's on my heart. And I hope that anyone who's out there looking for a DMP project, or I'm not in my master's, but if I was in my master's, this would be my project. My <laughs> husband told me, he said, launch this business and then you can do a study. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's just go ahead and talk about what has come out in the last year that has increased awareness about WAG and people are talking about it. And people are actually saying, yeah, it's an occupational hazard for PACU nurses. And it's not just PACU, it's OR as well. And also CRNAs, especially um, the anesthesia providers, uh, but especially the CRNAs are at the head of the bed. Um, and the nurses in the OR are also at the head of the bed uh, during intubation and extubation. Um, and pushing them out to PACU and there they are in PACU and uh, the patient's going to be off gassing for, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 30, 40 minutes um, mm -hmm. after they come out uh, of the OR, depending on what they have and how much they have. But um, the fact that that exposure is there um, all through surgical services, uh, unless you work in pre-op, you know, in pre-op, you're probably doing okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, uh, you're going to have some exposure there. Um, so do you want to talk about each one of the studies independently or just generally the information? Let's just go generally. And then um, there are a couple things in each of one of them. I might want to just jump in and highlight that I found as informative. 
it's more generally that all of them say that you should be tested, uh, that we should be testing the parts per million uh, that are in the facility. Um, actually, uh, when I was uh, looking at this in 2012, 13, around that time, um, our bioengineering, I got our bioengineering group uh, mm -hmm. to do heat testing, and we have a wand that will test the parts per million um, in the area. And it was so extremely high uh, when they first did it at 3, at 3 p.m. is when we did it. Mm -hmm. um, it was so extremely high um, that uh, my hospital uh, at the time uh, decided that it was inappropriate to do testing at 3 p.m. Uh, because it was falsely high. Um, so they changed the time that the testing was done uh, to 5 a.m. Um, and uh, we always passed. You know, everything looked great at 5 a.m. Um, sure it did. When anybody <laughs> works. Yeah. <laughs> There's no patients in PACU at 5 a.m. Um, so that's an example of how you, even if we did have it, when we have regulatory compliance someday, uh, there's going to be regulatory standards for this. I see it coming soon. Uh, but you have to be careful um, about workarounds. And that's an example. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do this at 5 a.m., you do that uh, testing for parts per million, it's great. Uh, if you are doing it at 3 p.m., not so much. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, it was 100, 125 times. Listen. 100 to 125 full times higher uh, than that recommendation uh, for those uh, levels, those recommended levels. So um, it isn't a little bit. When you said 125 times, that just rung a bell in my mind. So in um, the white paper that was done with ASPAN with Hygienist Association on page 10, they indicated that real-time plots, you know, with the wand where they were measuring the RELs of the um, WAG, 125 times higher than the NIOSH recommended exposure limit, mm -hmm. which is two parts per million is what they recommend. Um, if you can, and that's if you can smell the WAG. I oh, would yeah, if you can smell it, it's you're already 100 times more. Mm -hmm. uh, than what you're supposed to have. And I remember tasting it in my mouth when I was holding airways open. Singapore is sweet. It is. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it is like a- We both know it's sweet. Yeah, why would we know it's sweet? <laughs> <laughs> we know it is. <laughs> um. So yeah, that's, I mean, that's just shocking data. That's just shocking. So, um, and that's why we're talking about it because- yeah. It needs to have regulation, and um, and I'm so happy to see that Aspan came out with a clean air campaign this past year. And um, so, if you're interested in learning about that, you can go there to their website. Uh, they've got tons of references. I highly recommend that all managers, um, educators, and even staff nurses they read this white paper from front to back. Um, it is full of valuable information. It's referenced in our new standards book too. Mm -hmm. uh, it's referenced here as a um, position statement. Um, and the position statement nicely summarizes that white paper too. Um, you know what I did read in one of those, it might have, might have been the one from IHI. Uh, but if you mix um, nitrous oxide mm -hmm. with the halogenated gases. Uh, it is not two parts per million anymore. The recommendation is now 0.5 parts per million if it's mixed with nitrous oxide, which it commonly is because nitrous oxide has analgesic properties that the halogenated um, agents don't. Those are only sedative. They have right. no analgesic properties at all. So it's commonly mixed with um, nitrous oxide depending on uh, what your anesthesia group likes to do. But ask them, probably is. And if you're doing using nitrous oxide by itself, just by itself, uh, it has no odor at all. Um, so you can't tell uh, if you've got those um, really elevated levels. And one other thing about nitrous oxide, which is in most uh, mixed with most halogenated gases or by itself, is it will affect DNA synthesis. It inhibits, inhibits DNA synthesis. 
Um, so this is where a lot of miscarriages come from. Uh, mm -hmm. But also DNA synthesis. Okay, that's how you make your body's proteins, amino acids. ATP, ATP. And ATP is like molecular currency. It greases the wheels, yes, you know, any yes. molecular stuff happen. So if you're not making an ATP, this is why you end up with the renal hepatic uh, injury uh, or That's chronic um, fatigue and the headaches and your, your mitochondria is impaired um, mm -hmm. and potentially cancer. Yes, potentially cancer. Yeah. Um, so when you get those uh, labs drawn, when you get your health labs drawn, um, employee health uh, annually, I hope your hospital does that. Take a good look at your liver uh, renal function. Take a look at it. Yeah. It's then what I found really eye-opening when I was going through um, some of the literature, and this one is from the Division of Occupational Health and Safety, the DOHS, and they serve under the NIH. Um, and they published this in 2023, and this is their waste anesthesia gas um, uh, program and how they operate. And what I found really interesting, um, well, there were so many things in here that I know that hospitals aren't doing, um, having a wide uh, program manager, um, things that supervisors are responsible for, things that employees are responsible for. And one of those things in here that they recommend um, is to keep a health record of your employees for 30 years. Right, 30 years. 30 and years. Uh, family too. Uh, and the results of any pregnancy, uh, the results of any pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Nobody's asking me that. No. Uh, or uh, for male nurses, the uh, pregnancies uh, for their spouse. Mm -hmm. uh, or their health history for their spouse. So this is affecting families. Um, Absolutely. Not just individuals. Um, so I think that when we talk about reproductive health, um, men tend to be excluded uh, almost or not the focus, not the focus. So mm -hmm. I hope that the men who are at the bedside uh, hear this as well, that it is going to affect their reproductive um, health as well. Uh, and this will affect their spouse and their children. Uh, so there are defects, not just from women who have exposure to WAG, uh, but for fathers uh, who have exposure to WAG, having the uh, birth defects in their children too. Yeah, that's a really important thing to point out, Wendy, because we have a very large, large male nurse patient pop or population uh, in, in the OR and in PACU. Um, and as CRNAs, anesthesiologists. And so, yeah, absolutely correct. They should not be overlooked. They should be questioned um, on their health as well and their spouse's health, absolutely. In 30 years, why do you think we need to keep it for 30 years? When I saw, when I read that, you know, of course yeah. I'm like, well, now why do, why, do, why do they recommend 30 years? It's because they think there's long-term health risks. Um, and there's no other reason to do that. So if there's long-term health risks for you or for your offspring, um, that's something that should motivate every nurse to learn about waste anesthesia gas and how to take care of it um, and at their workplace. They're there every day. Um, and scavenging systems are really all we have. Mm -hmm. um, or ventilation.